and digging the hole with that. You've got far more power, far more depth to your insight. And that's why you understand why the superpower mindfulness is essential. But it's not just superpower mindfulness to get wisdom. All your, your superpowers, even the psychic powers come from this. When your mind is that strong, you can start to see other beings. You can get these psychic powers, which are very interesting, but only when your mind is very, very still and powerful. And you feel that's possible because you know the energy of a mind which has been enhanced. So this is why mindfulness is very important. And to go back, the doer and the knower, the two halves of the mind, the reason why it becomes empowered is because we don't give any energy to doing, to making, to thinking. So all the energy, instead of being wasted in doing, in thinking, in reacting, it all flows just into knowing. It's like we have this channel of water which can go two ways. You can go into doing things or you can go into knowing things. We do so much, we've got hardly energy left for being passive and to know. That's one of the reasons why people get depressed. Because they haven't got any energy left in just bare knowing. So what they know is just so dull, so grey, there's nothing which can actually enhance their happiness. If any of you have ever been to London, in around this time of the year, December and January, you know how miserable it can be. I, first time I went back after a month, after seven years, I went back to visit my, my mother at this time of the year, because it's Christmas time. I decided to go and visit her then, in December. I couldn't have chosen a worse time of the year. Those who've been to London would recognize this description. In December, the skies are all grey. You can't see any blue sky at all, it's just clouds. Even it rains, this drizzle, which is also grey. All the buildings are all grey stone. And the pavements and the roads, it's all grey as well. What clothes do people wear in England? Grey suits. It's all grey all over the place. And even worse, what tea do people in England drink? Oh, grey. <laughs> it's all grey, it's miserable. So no wonder people at that time of the year get depressed. And apparently there's a sickness which only comes that time of the year. Just people get depressed because they can't see anything to, to enliven their senses. There's no colour in life. There's no richness. And my brother told me that all they did, the only therapy they did to actually to get people out of this depression they took them into a room with very bright lights. They all wore these Hawaiian shirts with lots of colour and lots of sound just to actually to get their senses awake again. And this is actually what happens that when we're depressed we only see grey. Understand? There's no brightness in life. When you have a relationship with your husband or your wife you can't see any beauty in them anymore. You say, the spark has gone out of our marriage. It's just it's ordinary. Your husband, your wife are the same as you started with, but your mindfulness has gone down. And that's why you can't see what you've fallen in love with before. You can't see their beauty. You can't see even the beauty in life anymore. It's not life's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your wife. It's not your boyfriend or boyfriend, girl, uh, girlfriend's fault. It's your fault. Wake up. Develop powerful mindfulness. You'll be able to fall in love with your partner again. You'll be able to see their beauty. You'll be able to fall in love with life again. See life's richness. It's what happens. So this is what depression is. You get superpower mindfulness. You get more energy going into the knowing. So you know more. Knowing has got more energy. Because knowing has got more energy, it's turning the wattage up of your awareness. Whatever you see, you see more of. And when you see more of it, it's more happy. There's one thing I discovered through meditation. One of the powerful insights 
is energy, is happiness. Mental energy is equivalent to joy. The more energy you have in the mind, the happier you are. That's one of the reasons I'm a happy monk. I've got lots of mental energy. That's why I can sit up here and talk to you for an hour and a half. <laughs> Two hours? An hour? I don't know. Who cares? But that's why you get lots of energy when you're happy. So when the mindfulness receives all the energy, it becomes superpower mindfulness, not only do you see deeply, but you see with happiness. Anyone who's miserable is not mindful. It's obvious to me. And when you get really, really mindful, powerful mindful, you are happy. Energy is happiness. Mental energy. When the energy starts to flow into the mindfulness, that's when you start getting joyful in your meditation. You start to smile more. You become happy. And this meditation retreat really deserves its name. I've, for those of you who haven't heard this, this meditation retreat is not called Chempaka Lodge was the end of the year retreat. This is called Club Med PJ. <laughs> Club, Club Meditation Peddling Jaya. <laughs> and it deserves the name Club Med because Club Med is a happy place. And this is a happy place you meditate. And if by the end of this retreat you're not a happier little yogi, then I have not done my job. That's why in my meditation retreats, you know they take group photographs during the retreat? When I do my meditation retreat, at the group photograph at the end, everyone looks miserable. Because, oh, we have to go home. Because oh. <laughs> you're enjoying it. Because the energy goes into mindfulness, you become supercharged and you find, whether you like it or not, you are happy. You're joyful. And that's an important part of the Buddhist path. The Buddhist path is all about ending suffering, not making more suffering. Ending suffering. So you can test your progress by how much happiness you have. If you're getting happier and happier in this meditation retreat, you're making progress on the path, you're ending suffering more and more. The more you end suffering, the more happy you are. It's obvious. That's why when I was a young Buddhist, I understood that enough to go and check out the monks. Any miserable monks, I did have no faith in at all. Because <laughs> If they knew the end of suffering, why are they so miserable? It's just like you know, those advertisements. You know, when you buy the washing powder, it's supposed to make your clothes whiter. If you find out that you wash with that powder and it gets even dirtier, what good is that washing powder? So what good would Buddhism do if it makes you more miserable? So I was looking for the happy monks to see who understood the Dhamma. And I was very fortunate to see the happiest monk Actually, the happiest person, still the happiest person I've ever seen, was my teacher, Ajahn Chah. That's why you had faith in him. That's why you spent all those years eating, eating frog on rice and those other disgusting foods. Because there was a guy, I mean, that was really impressive. A guy who was happy, really happy. How come? Why? And then you found out why. So this power, this eightfold path, enhancing mindfulness, making it really strong, superpower mindfulness, and he was happy. Not only happy, but incredibly wise. He could see things which other people just couldn't see. Because his mindfulness was so sharp, so empowered. And if ever you look at the time of the Buddha, to check this out, one of the beautiful sutras is called the Dhamma Chaitya Sutra, usually translated as monuments to the Dhamma. It tells the story of one of the important figures in the time of the Buddha, King Pasenadi of Kosala, one of the Buddha's chief supporters. 
who just before he passed away went to see the Buddha in the Jeta Grove Monastery, which was right next to the capital of Kosala, Sawati. And when the king walked into the monastery, the first thing he had to he just kissed the feet of the Buddha first of all. Just all the happiness and joy he'd got in life was because of this great teacher. And one of the first things he said after this was how much he liked coming into this monastery because all the monks in this monastery were all smiling and happy. And the Buddha said, Yes, great king, that's how it is when you get success in your meditation. It's the Buddha's words. If your meditation is successful, you get happier. The smile gets wider, the eyes get brighter, as the mindfulness gets stronger, you get more power, and you're a happier little Buddhist. And that's by far the best way to teach Buddhism to your friends and loved ones. If you go and give them a Dharma book and say, read this, and you're miserable, they say, what's the point? But if you're happy, you don't need to actually to tell your friends and loved ones, oh, come to listen to the Dhamma. If you're happy, they say, where is it? I want to go. Take me. And that's true. Very, this, our vice president a year ago, she wrote a book about her life's journey. I was mentioned in her book because she went to see one of my talks and she saw this happy monk giving a Dhamma talk, she thought, ah, he's only putting this on. In public he smiles, but probably he's like everybody else and gets miserable when he's not on stage. So she wrote this book. She went to check out the monks. She went to follow them to the monastery to see whether this was really real happiness or whether they got miserable sometimes. If you want to check me out, ask Mangala, who's been looking after me the last couple of days. Asked if I shouted at him and got miserable. <laughs> or Amata, his brother, who sometimes looks after me in the PGF. Ask people who've not just seen me on stage, but seen me when I first got up in the morning. And then you'll know if this is a happy monk or not. But she checked it out. She found out, yeah, it's real happiness. And she wrote in her book, I don't know what those monks were on, but I want some of it. <laughs> and she became... <laughs> And she became a Buddhist because of that. She saw happiness. Even some years ago, when I was visiting England, visiting my mother, there was one of the monks there. He was working in the prisons. He's doing a really good job. And he managed to convince the prison systems in UK to have what he called a Buddha grove. What the Buddha grove was is actually in these open prisons with a bit of land around them, he managed to get some, I think mostly Thai supporters to donate a Buddha statue, a big one. Some of the prisoners actually built a nice stand, planted trees around. It was a place of peace and quiet for the prisoners to reflect. And this actually was so successful because if you're in the jail, sometimes what you don't have is just quietness to actually to reflect on what you've done and heal the pain of your crime and become a better person. So they built these Buddha groves, and I think there's many of them, maybe 20 or 30 in the prisons in England now, all agreed to by the Home Office. Even though this is just it's a Buddha statue, everyone realizes this is a place of peace, whether you're a Christian, a Hindu or Muslim, the prisoners go there to sit quietly and reflect. It's a Buddha grove. And of course you can imagine the good it does. That's why all the prison... Uh, superintendents all support this up to the hilt. You build it, we'll maintain it. But when the first one was established, I happened to be in UK, I was invited for the opening ceremony. Now, part of the opening ceremony, as many of you Buddhists know, I've been giving the speeches, I think we had the, the head of the prisons there, not the, not the Home Secretary, but I think the head of the prisons department in UK, the civil servant, and then the governor and a few other dignitaries, MPs, they all gave their speeches. And then, of course, we did some chanting. And after the chanting, we did the circumambulation. You know what we do around 
like Buddha statues or stupas at Waisak Day, we go around with candles and incense, walking around three times. Now I was so inspired. I'm very easy to, to get inspired by really good things, wonderful things. And as I was going around, I had this huge smile on my face. I was so happy. Now this is Buddhism, this is, this is uh, compassion, this is kindness, and we're actually helping people who really need help, prisoners. What a wonderful idea, what a beautiful thing this was, to have a Buddha statue inside one of Her Majesty's prisons in UK. Oh, I was so happy. And as I was going around, out of the corner of my eye, I saw two prisoners who were looking at me. They weren't Buddhists, they were saying, you know, what's going on? Let's have a look, see what's happening. And they saw me, and I heard them as one turned to the other, and they pointed to me. He's on the gear. The gear means drugs. <laughs> <laughs> they looked at me and think, the only way he can be that happy is to take drugs. I said, no, no, I don't need drugs. Just superpower, mindfulness, inspiration, the Dhamma. That's what made me happy. So this is actually what that lady saw. She saw that type of happiness which usually you only see on people who's high on drugs or alcohol or who's high on wisdom, peace and compassion. Who's high on mindfulness. When you get that sort of happiness, please follow it. You don't get attached to that type of happiness. That is a happiness of freedom, of liberation. So the Buddha said, don't be afraid of those happinesses, indulging them. This is what's supposed to happen in your meditation. So when you get superpower mindfulness, you're going to be one happy little yogi. And that's good. Every retreat which I've taught, there's always one or two who really get happy. And it's one of the greatest gifts you can give me as a teacher. Usually what happens, they come and interview, but sometimes they can't wait for an interview. They're waiting on the path when I go back to my room. And they look at me and say, Ajahn Brahm, I've done it. <laughs> and it's so sweet. And the tears are coming out of their eyes. The more happiness than they've ever experienced before. Superpower mindfulness brings you so much happiness and joy. And that's called empowering your mind. It's part of the path. There's other things as well, but that is what I'm emphasizing today. So mindfulness is for your life, for your happiness, for your success, and even for your enlightenment. So thank you for listening. Okay, now any questions about mindfulness and super power mindfulness? Is there a question? I give a special prize for the first question this evening. Who wants the first special prize? Okay, the special prize is, sir, a free haircut. <laughs> oh, you get a free haircut. No, I'll give you a free haircut. Is there a difference between mindfulness and awareness? No, there's not. Because mindfulness you know, actually means like being aware. But I only focused on awareness. But awareness also comes with actually um, knowing what to do as well. You're mindful, you're aware. But when you see what's going on, automatically, if, for example, if you're very aware and about to step on a snake, because of your awareness, you'll never step on them. you go on another path. So awareness will always give rise to wise action, compassionate action. So it's not just bare mindfulness or bare awareness. There's a consequence of that, which is automatic. You can't stop yourself. You'll avoid that which is harmful. You'll only do that which is good. It's exactly the same. Mindfulness and awareness. Sati. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Uh, you don't have to take up the free haircut. I'll, I'll absolve you of that, <laughs> that price. Yes. <laughs> 